Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take him, take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. All right, so now we're going to get to see this view of what is to be done ritualistically to clean a leper who has now been healed of his leprosy. This has been on the books since this Leviticus 14, since the beginning of the nation of Israel. And from that time, through recorded history that we have, that I have ever seen and been taught, not once did any of the high priests or priests of the nation of Israel ever perform this ritual. Not once had they ever pronounced a man or woman to have had leprosy and then had to go through this because they were healed outside of a direct act of God. You have Miriam, the sister of Moses, is stricken with leprosy for a week and then has come back healed. Maybe they did this routine with her in numbers. When you have Naaman is stricken with leprosy, he is healed by dunking in the Jordan, washing the Jordan seven times as prescribed by Elisha. Not a Jew, he doesn't have to follow these rules. So this ritual was not followed. No one actually used this until Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up as the Messiah and began healing lepers. They then went back to those priests who years before often would have called them unclean and they would have to look this back up and say, how do we, has anybody ever healed a leper? Have we ever had to do this before? What are those things we need to take? What scroll was that in? I want to make sure I have it right because it's not something I've had to do. Not until Jesus comes ahead and does this. And as we see these things, we will see some of these things once again pointing to Christ. The priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. An earthen vessel, a symbol of Jesus's earthly frame that he took on, his earthly body, that the word of God took when he became the expressed image of God on earth. A sacrifice made in this form, over running water, over living water, which Jesus says he is the living water. We will have tor torrents of living water flowing from us because of his sacrifice and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them. And the living bird and the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy. And shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. So he dips the living bird in the blood of the one who was sacrificed and sprinkles this mixture on the healed leper seven times, a sign of complete healing, of complete cleansing. And then they let that bird loose, the fly into the sky dripping wet with blood and water. This mixture of the spirit and the blood of Christ being set free from the sin and disease and death of this world. He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. 
After that he shall come into the camp and shall stay outside his tent seven days. But on the seventh day he shall shave all his hair of his head and his beard and all his eyebrows. All his hair he will shave off. He shall wash his clothes and wash his body in water and he shall be clean. So seven days to be a time of a complete observation to see whether or not he is fully cleansed and is remained cleansed. He will shave off his hair again, any that is regrown. He will shave off his beard, his eyebrows, and wash his clothes and will be completely cleansed again as having a complete and fresh start at life. As we are, when we accept Christ, accept and trust in his promises and the blood he shed for our remission of sins, we are reborn anew, our spirit is sanctified, brought back to life. We are justified in the eyes of God. We are clothed in his righteousness and washed clean in his blood. We are new people. Incomplete renewal in the eyes of God. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish. One ewe lamb of the first year without blemish. Three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and one log of oil. Then the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who, who is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the priest shall make one male or shall take one male lamb and offer it as a trespass offering and the log of oil and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he shall kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering in the burnt offering in a holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest's, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. So we're saying when you're doing this with the leper, it is done the same way. You get to keep these same portions for yourself. The wave and the heave offering, the, 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 the grain that you don't burn, all this is still kept as with all the other provisions that we've spoken about with these offerings. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering. The priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the right thumb of his hand, and the big toe of his right foot. Once again, showing that this person has been cleansed. They have been brought new into the world. Once again, healed and ready to walk among his people, to be in the presence of God, to hear the word of God, to do the work that God has prescribed for him and to walk in right standing by the way of God. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil, pour it onto the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord, that the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest shall put some oil on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of the, his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the trespass offering, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. So the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. Being mixed with the refreshing, sanctifying blood, and anointed with a symbol of the Spirit, this Holy Spirit being washed in the Spirit, being told to walk and hear and work in the Spirit of the Lord, return to His presence to do work in His way, by His command. All throughout Scripture, you see Christ, if you know to look for it. Then the priest shall offer the sin offering and make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanliness. Afterward, he shall kill the burnt offering and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. So the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. But if he is poor and cannot afford it, then he shall take one male lamb as a trespass offering to be waived to make atonement for him, one tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, a log of oil, and two turtle doves and or two pigeons, such as he is able to afford. One shall be a sin offering, the other a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest on the eighth day for his cleansing, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, 
And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. And the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, to make atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons, such as he can afford, such as he is able to afford, the one is a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering with the grain offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him who is to be cleansed before the Lord. This is the law for one who had a leper sore who cannot afford the usual cleansing. So once again, before the Lord, our wealth, our material things do not set us apart from each other. Before the Lord, we are equal. We are completely equal. So one person's wealth doesn't allow them to buy a greater level of atonement, allow them to buy a place of cleansing where the poor do not. The Lord makes a way for each person, not putting one off for the other, not placing one above the other. That's what our sinfulness has wrought in the world. That is what wickedness has brought. That is what secularism has brought. A way of looking at the world as a Machiavellian paradigm where the ends justify the means. That to get to the top, it doesn't matter how you get there. Because being at the top is the only good in the world. The only way you can be successful is if you are able to get there. It doesn't matter how you get there or who you have to hurt to get there. The only child worth love is the one who brings something to the table. The only person worth respect in the world is the one who does something with which to earn that respect. The only person who deserves to be listened to is the one who has the ability to raise themselves up on top of others. That is a flaw of man, not the will and heart of God. God is perfect. Man is flawed. We look at the outside. We look at the accomplishments. We look at the things of this world. God is perfect. Perfectly sovereign above all. Perfectly just. In that no one sin is judged harsher or lighter than the other. All are judged equal. The wages of all sin is the same. But perfectly loving to keep that in balance. Perfectly loving in a way that he has offered us mercy and grace. Mercy and grace that we simply do not deserve. To a people who continue to be stiff-necked in rebellion. To children who turn and show nothing but ingratitude to the blessings with which he has bestowed. Even for us among the brethren, we do this so often in ways of turning an envious eye to others. For seeing what they have and we do not. And even if it is only in our own minds, 
lashing out in a way that why do I not have that and what did they do to deserve it? I have done this. So many of us, even of the brethren, we all look at ourselves as as the prodigal son that walked away and had to come back. And in so many cases, we are that son. But in everyday life, we are not. We are the other one who stayed by and is now saying, Lord, I have been loyal to you. Why do I not have what you are giving to him? But the Lord has not broken us out that way. The Lord does not look at us that way. He blesses as he sees fit because he knows what is best. Me, myself, let's use anecdotal. I'll attack myself in this one. If I was rich, if I had any level of wealth, I would be too lazy to even do this program. So giving me an abundance of wealth would make my life much easier, but make me less effective and less desirous to go out and attempt to glorify his kingdom and glorify his name. It would make me so much more likely to sit back and sit in the comfort of what he has blessed me with. And where that would be appreciated, and I would appreciate the Lord for it, it wouldn't be doing the work he has set before me. This program might have an audience of one. But if that one is finding it fruitful and finding his name glorified, then that is a work worth doing. And it is a love that I show to him because of the love he first showed to me in allowing me to be brought forth from my unbelief, from my wickedness, from my blasphemous past, into a place where I can feel his presence and his love and his mercy because he doesn't look at me and say, you aren't as successful as him, so I care less about you. That is not the heart of the Lord. The heart of the Lord is for all who turn from their wicked way and confess to him, say the same thing, homilageo, say the same thing. And where he has said, you have gone out from me and need to return, I have said, you're right, Lord, I have gone out from you. Please allow me to return. And he is merciful and graceful enough to allow me that opportunity to come back to him and feel his warm embrace. Not again, but for the first time. Because it's where I always should have been. But moving on to verse 33, where we will see that once again, as with the garments in our last installment, that Leprosy is speaking more than just a skin disease and a disease that, as Hansen's disease, can be debilitating and deadly. That this is speaking more about leprosy as in a form of disease that can come upon objects. So it would be mold and in some cases something much wickeder. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you have come into the land of Canaan, which I give to you as a possession, and I put the leprous plague in a house in the land of your possession. Now, this is an interesting verse because it says that the Lord is placing the leprous plague in the house, in the land of your possession. Now, is he putting it in because of something that the Israelites did? Or is it putting, being put in because of something of the people already living in that house. Because as we're told, 
he is going to drive the people out and then the Israelites are going to take possession of their possessions. So from what we know about certain people that were living in the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, people like that, they were often incredibly wicked and idolatrous. And some of the wickedness that they would follow is Moloch, who they would burn their children alive to. Moloch would be this iron statue with its hands out and you would light a fire in its belly or in its mouth and it would heat up the entirety of the metal of the statue so that every piece of it, including the hands are red hot. And then you would take the newborn baby normally as soon as it had been born, as soon as it came out of the birth canal, you would snip the, the umbilical cord and put the baby in the hands not in the fire, in the hands, and allow it to fry to death. Another thing that they would also sometimes do to consecrate, I guess would be the word, to their false idolatrous God is you would take when you build a house to bless the house, you would take a newborn and you would brick it into the wall a live child, you would take the child and you would brick it into the wall and close it into the wall as a thing to appease your God. So you would take your child, you would brick the child into the wall and kill the child in the process. So in this case, would he have been placing the leprous plague in the house that this had been done? Don't really know. That is a possibility though. And he who owns the house comes and tells the priest, saying, It seems to me that there is some plague in the house. So the person now taking over the house is saying, Hey, seems like there's something going on here. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine the plague, that all that is in the house may not be made unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to examine the house, and he shall examine the plague. And indeed, if the plague is on the walls of the house, with ingrained streaks, reddish or brown, uh, greenish or reddish, which appeared to be deep in the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look. And indeed, if the plague is spread on the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which is the plague, and they shall cast them into the unclean place outside the city. This more than likely is referring to mold mildew if something is growing if some kind of moss is growing with the way that they would build these houses then you have an issue that could be spreading disease and you need to remove the stone so that you know you need to take everything out remove the stone so that way they don't become infected themselves and he shall cause the house to be scraped inside all around and the dust that they scrape off shall, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones. And he shall take other mortar, mortar and plaster the house. So basically, you're going to take stones. You're now going to replace them. And now you're going to remortar and replaster the house. So hopefully to get rid of all these things. Now, if the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after he has taken away the stones, after he has scraped the house and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look, and indeed, if the plague has spread in the house, it is an act of leprosy in the house. It is unclean. So if you've already done all these things, and then it comes back again, now there's an issue, and it needs to be considered unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones, its timber, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them outside the city to an unclean place. Moreover, he who goes into the house at all while it is shut up shall be unclean until evening. And he who lies down in the house shall wash his clothes and he shall, he who eats in the house shall wash his clothes. So basically the people who now have to take this house apart are going to be considered unclean for the day. They'll have to wash themselves and be ready for the evening. But if the priest comes in and examines it, indeed the plague has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because that plague is healed. And he shall take to cleanse the house two birds, cedarwood, scarlet, and hyssop. 
Then he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water, and he shall take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird in the running water, and the living bird with the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet. Then he shall let the living bird loose outside the city in the open field to make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. So basically you're cleaning out the same, the house the same way you would consider a person clean with the same ingredients to make it ceremonially clean after the plague is not returned. This is the law for any leper sore and scale, for the leprosy of a garment and a, of a house, for a swelling and a scab, a bright spot, to teach when it is clean and when it is unclean, this is the law of leprosy. So two full chapters of Le Leviticus going simply over the different forms of what they would call leprosy. One in a person that is deadly, debilitating, and contagious, and one that is household and garment-filled possessions that could cause other basic illnesses throughout the house and could spread and could then spread illness to other people as a public safety measure. Now, each of these things sometimes seems a little awkward to us, but they are meant as a way to help the fledgling nation setting up in the promised land as these books are written by Moses to understand this is what you need to do to be in right standing for God. This is what you need to do to be clean so that you can take care of your neighbor, to love your neighbor as yourself. So that way, the community will flourish. And from a flourishing community will come a flourishing nation. From a flourishing nation will bring the surrounding nations to the right worship of the one and only living God. And in so doing, will point them to the eventual coming of the one who will once and for all blot out sin and create a path to reunite all creation with God, with the loving Father that is doting after this fledgling newborn nation. All things done for their good. Things that sometimes seem boring or unnecessary or even just tough to get through as we're trying to read through the Bible. All things meant for the good of his people, for the edification of his people. And there are lessons for each of us to take in these things. Even if it's no more than seeing how often the Old Testament and the law points to the Messiah, to Christ, the God who came in earthly flesh to create a path for us to return to the Father in right standing and usher us into eternity. All scripture is breathed out by God and is good for the edification of the brethren. All of it. Every word. Every verse. We can use it all to grow closer to him. Because we live by truth to be set apart for him. And that truth comes from his revealed word to us. So that's where we will end it for this morning. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you again next time, but until then, be blessed.